Not at, just the eight, the super eight. It's super eight. And I, my dinner that night, I went to the super Walmart. A lot of supers. The more supers you see, the less super any of it really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's really super, it, it, it doesn't have to brag about how super it is. No. That's why I watch Superman. I'm like, are you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trek and heavier traveling light. There's one thing that's right wherever I go. That's where I am. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Zoltan. I am Zoltan. And next to me is a very funny comedian uh, from Chicago here in New York City, Mike Lobovitz. Welcome hey, to the what's show. going on? Yeah. Hey, hey, Zoltan. How are you? <laughs> Do I look into this one or that one? I think you can choose. All right. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, good. I, I like to just dart around to make sure that yeah, none yeah. of the shots... Catch me if you can. It'd be funny yeah. if you look into that one and I look into that one. Well, I think and that's like <laughs> We're just idea. like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And we're both looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about like how much production now goes into podcasts and then... And back when, and you forget that people listen sometimes. It was almost like a warning to me, like, hey, I might end up saying something on this podcast that I'm going to regret and ask for a a, a retraction. Totally. Like it's a newspaper or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that reminded me of a story. One time I did a podcast, a short-lived video podcast of that time I bombed. And we just tell bomb stories. And I told a story of one time I went on stage with an edible and I was too high and I was supposed to do like 15 minutes and I ran off stage stage at like four minutes mm-hmm. and I was I was not having it and this guy who had been coming to my shows a lot he has a giant scar some horrible accident happened to this man where he has a giant scar and his eyes like lower than this other eye uh-huh. and he came up to me and he was just like kind of browbeating me a little bit about like oh man I brought my friends blah 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 I thought this and this and I just couldn't I was too high to defend myself right. and then I told that story and the guy left a comment saying like oh man I'm really sorry <laughs> <laughs> like you apologize. And I was like, I would have never told the story if like I knew you would have heard this. Yeah, but it's probably it's even better that way. I mean, right? Because now you know you're having an impact. Now he knows the full story. Is like he brought his friends out. He was a fan. Was he yeah, a fan? but uh, here's the thing. He was a fan of mine, but he didn't know I was going to be on the show. Which is why oh. I was upset that he was upset at me. It was just a happy coincidence. It was he just was, like a bonus that didn't happen. It was a bonus that I failed at, that I mm-hmm. messed up, but it's not like I was advertised. It was a showcase with no comedians advertised, and I was going on last to do 15 minutes, did four, panicked, ran off. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I did. As you do. As, yeah, I yeah. told one story. Oh, no, we can uh, touch knees like under it. the I table. Like That's yeah. how people know we're comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like just hairy. That's just for us. They won't see it. Yeah, that's that's just for your pleasure and my own. Uh, but yeah, I went on to say, I, I remember, because everyone I was on the show with, uh, way higher tolerance to the marijuana than me. Mm-hmm. And I took an edible, and I noticed it was affecting them, and they were going on earlier. Uh-huh. And I'm like, well, I'm, and I'm telling them, I don't want to go up. And they're like, you're going to have a great time. And I'm like, I'm not having a good time now, mm-hmm. in the back. And they're like, ah, you'll, you'll be fine. So I go up, and I tell my first bit, it's kind of like a story, and... I finish it. Everyone laughs where they're supposed to, but because I'm in my own head, I go, is that just me or did that take eight years to tell? And they're like, audience went what? And I just went, I'm high. They gave me an edible and I don't like it. And then I just did my closer and ran off. And uh, that's why I I don't do, I don't do that anymore. Did the uh, closer work? Yes. Yeah, the closer worked. Every, all the jokes worked. The only part that didn't work or wasn't even supposed to work was just my admittance that I was high. Yeah. And them just not reacting and looking at me, it felt very judgy from a room of like 100 people. It felt like 100 people were judging me. Yeah, when at you're a time, super high, it always feels that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, now yeah. I'm re- like, now it's like confirming. And so I'm like, I got to get out of here. And then that's exactly what I would do at a party if I was high. And I felt like everyone was, I'd run, I'd leave immediately. Right. But it wouldn't, you wouldn't have had, like, it's not like you go to a party and they're like, all right, you're going to do 15. You only do four. (laughs) Exactly. You're like, dude, stand in that corner. Look at that wall. No one's going to bother you. What I love about this story, Zoltan, is that it's supposed to be a story about you bombing. Yes. But it's actually a story about you having a good set that didn't feel good. Yeah. I think it was more about me not, uh, man, that's so true. Because there was plenty of bomb bomb stories that I did tell on that podcast too but like that one was just one where I ran off the stage because I couldn't cover my time because I was in my own head yeah like the jokes went fine like no one was upset 
I was upset with myself. Yeah. With my own integrity. <laughs> those I mean, those edibles are sneaky. They I don't are. They uh <laughs> you never know that you don't know. I we it says a number on it and the number is meaningless. It it means nothing and you don't know when it's gonna kick in, how it's gonna kick in, if, if it, it will ever, ever, ever end ever end, ever yeah. kick in. Yeah. Uh we took it to go see Barbie and Afterwards, my wife and I were like, and it turned in? into Oppenheimer. Yeah, right? that's yeah. Right. <laughs> but maybe it was the movie, but I could never tell if it kicked in mm -hmm. or if I was like, no, this movie is that funny. Like I could <laughs> never tell. I bet it kicked in. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't see it, but I'm guessing. I'm guessing it kicked in. It was in. pretty funny. Yeah, it, I haven't it, seen it. I don't know. It, it had like really funny lines in it, but I didn't. Uh, at the end, I'm like, I don't know if that movie was that funny or the, that five milligram hit us right, right in the. Uh, uh, brain. Well, the only way to test that is to take a 10 and go back. Take a 10? I can't do 10, dude. Yeah. I, I, well, who knows what those numbers even mean? I, what do they mean? I they know. mean nothing. I used to work for this um, weed delivery company in New York City, like over the pandemic. I was like one of these, before it was like legal, legal. <laughs> it was like one of these bicycle guys, you know, so they- You would, delivered weed to people yeah, yeah, on I'd a have bike. Like, I'd have this big box in a backpack and I'd get a text from my boss, you know, go, he has these clients who order, so you gotta go ride there and you open up right. the box. And there are all these different strains, all these different kinds of edibles. And and it's like, you know, they're like asking, well, what does this one do? Well, how much is in this one? What's it? And it's like, bro, m my boss has a printer. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I can tell you whatever you want. You can read the label, but like, that's just a box with some shit in it. And uh, I really can't tell you. I'm here to bring you a box of marijuana and you're gonna have fun with it is what's gonna happen now. Yeah, or maybe you will have a bad time. But either way, like I, like anything I tell you will be my best guess. I prefer that brand of honesty as opposed to the guy that knows the weed too much behind the counter and he mm -hmm. gives you a breakdown. This one's more of a giggly high. This is more of a heady high. This is one, have you ever wanted to like feel your heartbeat? Uh, on the train. This is one for that. And yeah, you're like, like whoever yeah, wanted like, that? Nobody <laughs> wants this to, stuff. to be high taking their pulse on the train. I've, I've finally hit the age where I know uh, whether alcohol, weed, or caffeine has kicked in when I feel just a twinge of panic in my heart. Uh -huh. That's when I know. I'm like, oh. That's a good sign. It's here. Yeah. It's here. It's hard to find joy in I'm these I'm appropriately substances. afraid right now. <laughs> yes. Good, good. It's just this slight panic of... You're not at home, <laughs> and, and which even still kicks in at home. Uh huh. Yeah. But, well, because at home it kicks in, and it's like you're not at the hospital. <laughs> no, you just anything could happen. Anything could happen. Yeah. What is that smell? Well, you know where my mind always goes when I'm very relaxed and not in my own head or in my own head, I guess, is what if there's a fire, and you gotta you and your wife gotta grab these cats and your passport and make it out to the front. Like, how are you going to handle an emergency? You ever been that messed up where you're like, how would I handle an emergency if it happened right now? And then it just terrifies the hell out of you. Um, I mean, I probably have been. I think it's very telling that in your high emergency, like the, the apartment could be in blazes and like you got to dig around and find your passport. Yeah, you know, you, you know how much of a pain in the ass it is to get another passport or my social security card. I don't even know which office you're supposed to go. I got to go. You go find to the my, social security office. Yeah, but I got to go find my birth certificate. I, it's just no. A I know. Hassle. I know. It's I know. It's a pain. But imagine like the uh, eulogy at your funeral. <laughs> if only he wasn't so worried about hightailing it out of the country, he could be here giving this speech himself. Because of him, for, it, for his cats, his wife who and also cats didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would make it. Yeah, I, I'm not prepared for all emergencies, and I might be judging a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you look like you make the perfect bicycle weed delivery person that I've ever like. Oh yeah, I came straight from Central Casting. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like they, they probably walked in and they're like, "Hired? What? Yeah, yeah. dude, hired." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also the interview process was pretty lax. I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Assume they're like, do you have a bike? I mean, I had been working there for six months before I ever met my boss. So wow, it's just kind of like a referral kind of thing. I love that because to me that just sounds like you were a drug dealer that didn't get to meet the top kingpin. Yeah, that's about right, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, doesn't that sound like no, no, no? I'm I'm a new low level level dealer. I'm not going to meet the guy who flies in from Colombia, right? Because that's the main cheese. I mean, there was a guy, I mean, there might have been a Columbia guy, um, although I think the weed all comes from this country. Yeah, probably. But uh, the the boss dude was like this New York dude, but he liked to have this like air of mystery. 
you know, so like you never knew if he was like following you on your runs or he, like, you, you know, he'd be texting you like, I see where you're at. You better fucking hurry up. And, you really? Know. Yeah. But like, uh, yeah, I don't know. But it was like, it was, it was kind of an act. I think it was, it was a weird, it was a weird thing, but the money was good and there wasn't anything else going on. So there's a couple comedy clubs like that. Have you worked out? Like, uh, I think the two that come to mind, Comedy Castle in, uh, outside of Detroit, Oh, and Royal Oak? Yeah, Royal Oak. I Mark Ridley. Yeah, Mark Ridley. Uh, so I've never met Mark Ridley. I don't know any comic that has. Uh, but the thing is, like, there's cameras, and he's watching your sets. And and you never meet him. But he always says nice things. You always hear nice things, like, mm -hmm. oh, he really enjoyed your set. But it's this weird... It's not even a threat. It's just like, oh, by the way, he's watching on cameras. That one in, in Brad Garrett's club in Vegas kind of is the same thing. Like, oh, he has cameras, so he's watching your sets, and you're like, oh, okay. So it's not a veiled threat of like, oh, get to that punchline quicker. It's just this weird, like... I just but the owner's this... keeping tabs, yeah. even though he feels like he's not here and doesn't give a shit, right? which is probably the case. It's it, To me, it feels like when you drive down a highway in the south or wherever, and they're like, we we have uh, we have airplanes to check your speed through radar. It's like, no, you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have that. You just want me to do 70. Yeah, you're just trying to trick me into following the law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. on to your game. Don't trick me into trying not to bomb. Yeah, if, yeah. I, if I decide to bomb, I'm going to bomb. You're just trying to keep me alive on this highway. I see what <laughs> you're doing. No, but I like, I mean, the, um, the, the, fa I've, I've never been to Brad Garrett's. Um, I've been to Mark Ridley's in Royal Oak. I met Mark Ridley. This was like early on. You actually on. met the man. I met him. He exists. Okay. I mean, um, I assumed he did, but like, what, what's he like? Who is he nice? What's, is he tall? Well, I like, just spoke to him on an intercom. I actually didn't get to see his face. See? No, no, no. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, he's like, he's like a big jovial okay. dude. And I drove up there. I used to do this like when I was first starting out. I was like, well, how do you get out on the road? Oh, it's the hardest part of it. So, so I would just like go to I, something. Was, I would start in Chicago. I'd go to Detroit. I'd go mm -hmm. to Milwaukee. I'd go to just all these Indianapolis. i go to these cities that are like, you know, a five hour drive or less. Not and booked on anything. Just well, go. I would, no, no, no. I would call ahead of time. I would try and get on the, like the local showcases or the I open see. mics or whatever and meet people. And so I was doing that in Detroit. And uh, and I met Mark Ridley at at the castle because I, I guess T J Miller was there and I asked him, "Hey, can I do a guest spot?" Yeah, on show fellow guy? Chicago guy. So, yeah. So I brought like my uh, my headshot and my resume, yeah. and I was like, I was like, "Hey, uh, Mark, you know, thank you for the opportunity. I would love to work in this club. I, I have like a little press packet if if you want it." And he goes, oh, yeah, I'll take that. And I'll put it right in the circular file. And he threw it in the trash in front of me. It was pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. But he was saying it jokingly. Like, yeah, but yeah. I, I have not been back. And that was <laughs> nine years ago. I work at the place in Ann Arbor. So I figure like when I go to Detroit, I'm going to Ann Arbor. I'm not. you know. Right. I'm, um, I'm working that Ann Arbor one for the first time in a couple of weeks. Oh, uh, Roger's so, the best. That's yeah, a, that's a I've great emailed run. with him. Hopefully, I get to meet him in person. I think I will. He usually, well, I don't know. When I've been working there forever, so like he usually comes on Friday night. Okay, but maybe you know, I don't. I don't. Yeah, who knows? But it, that's that's so funny that that whole like, because uh, that's a question that no one could ever answer me when I was starting up in comedy. Like, how do you work? How do you get on the road? Like, how do you do that? I remember Sinbad once on a podcast said he started working the road and headlining by just showing up to clubs. He took the Greyhound and looked up all the comedy clubs in the country and just drove the, and hopped on a bus and went mm -hmm. there. And then he showed up on Thursday or whenever the week started and goes, hey, I'm Sinbad. I'm here to headline this weekend. And they're like, what? Like, we don't we didn't we don't have you booked. And he's like, what? Uh, can I use your phone? And then he makes up a thing like, oh, my manager sent me here. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be working here and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, yeah, we don't have you booked. And he's like, well, can I can I do like a guest spot or something? And he'd go up and do a guest spot crush because he's Sinbad. Mm -hmm. And then they'd book him. Then they'd be like, oh, all right, well, you can come back on this day. And that's how he got started, which would never work today. No, no, no. You can't roll up to a club now and be like, I'm here to headline. Oh, I'm not here. Let me send a carrier, carrier pigeon to my <laughs> to my manager. Oh, we'll hear back in a week. I'm uh <laughs> Well, let me just do a guest spot. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a, like, I wish I could have done that. But I did the thing you just talked about where you had, I printed out, my mom had a photo printer and I printed out two headshots and I had a folder and I put one headshot on the outside of me doing comedy and then a proper headshot. Head, yeah, an action shot. And then a proper headshot in the inner flap with the DVD and a printed out resume 
of like every comedy contest that I've entered. And mm-hmm. and then I sent that out. <laughs> right, right, right. I sent every out every like, contest I ever lost is yeah, on this page. Yes, yeah. Everything I've ever entered that uh, had no qualifications needed to be a part of. Uh, and then I but mailed at least shows those that out. You're like, doing it and you're hustling and stuff try it and i got one road gig out of it i got to open in topeka kansas at jeremiah bullfrogs it was booked by chuck johnson okay and uh i they paid two everyone's or, dream topeka and, yes i'm like this never is met the anyone start. who finally made it happen but dude this is the start and then i is 250 bucks is what i got paid it cost me 450 to fly out there and so i was already losing mm-hmm. money 250 no hotel no 250 and a hotel okay super eight and I ate Not at, just the eight, the super eight. It's super eight. And I, my dinner that night, I went to the super Walmart. A lot of supers. The more supers you see, the less super any of it really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's really super, it, it, it doesn't have to brag about how super it is. No. That's why I watch Superman. I'm like, are you really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, are, are you uh, Superman or is this like a super Walmart of Superman where yeah. you're like, it's bigger, but just as sad? Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're a sad man. Yeah, this is more Christopher Reeves post accident than Superman. Is that a little dark? Maybe I don't know your target demo here. That I was don't. that was p- the perfect amount of illumination for me. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, that night I went and grabbed a uh, Larry the Cable Guy TV dinner from the Super Walmart. Ate it from the microwave in my Super Eight, and to lose. Uh, probably, I mean, if you add it all up, I probably lost like 600 bucks on that trip. Yeah. But it was my first, like, full, like, out of state road gig. And I felt so accomplished to lose that much money to do okay in, in Topeka, Kansas. No, that's what's so, that's how, like, you know that, like, you actually want to do something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, like, so much easier to just, like, get a stupid job and just, like, keep your mouth shut and do what you're told and, like, actually make money like if you're willing to yeah i don't know if there's ever much money to be made for me it was always going to be general labor jobs like i was unloading trucks that kind of thing yeah but but yeah i i did those jobs for nine years before i was able to do this full time and i was sad the entire time like i was Mm -hmm. always thinking of of something else like what uh i guess what was your first outside chicago was it was it comedy castle um, I think the first place that I got paid to like do stand up was um, the um, JD's Comedy Cafe in Milwaukee. I heard it. Is this the one that was under a strip club? No, that's the other one. Oh, okay. um, there's another club. I've done that one too. Gosh, I forget what that one's called. It's like Milwaukee Comedy Cafe. I th- I've never no, no, did no, no, it. No, it's the same. Milwaukee's. So it used to be JD's Comedy Cafe. And then, okay. I'll tell you the whole Milwaukee. I, I'll well, give I'm you the interested. lowdown on like. Then we'll um, get into Dahmer. Lately. <laughs> they might intersect. We'll see. But yeah, the whole like sort of late, two, uh, you know, 2008 to like mm-hmm. 2012 Milwaukee comedy scene. So there was this place called JD's Comedy Cafe. And then there was this other place that was under a strip club, which I forget what it's called, but is that's maybe the worst room I've ever done in my life. You walk in and there's like, there's one of the rules for admission is like no tattoos above the neck, which is like, you know, that's a dress code. Um, But it's like, you know, they don't put that there because they didn't have a bunch of people with face tattoos coming in, right? Right. Which is, I guess you couldn't get away with that now, but back in the day you could be like, no, no face tattoos. Now it would be like impinging on like someone's civil rights or whatever. Well, also you're cutting out a large portion of people that might come because face tattoos are so much more common now. Right. I'm just picturing what trouble was caused at this club to where they're like, all right, no more tattoos above the neck. Right, right. How many how many the guys riots? with tattoos below the neck, they come in and they behave. They behave. But they tip. the ones above the neck, they're always bothering the strippers. <laughs> this, this is the Mason Dixon line of what's appropriate and what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's right here, this curve in your neck. I wonder if they just sent them up to the strip club. And they're like, hey, you got a tattoo above the neck? You're heading to the strip club. That's right. That's Below right. the neck, you're li- you're here to listen to art. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's only only our most means. sophisticated clientele. <laughs> In the basement for com, and they used to set it up. So, like the one time I did it, there was like they seated audience on this side of the room, and they seated audience on this side of the room, but like no one down the middle. So you got two different. O- You've done shows. I've like done that. that, and you're like, why, why, man? If you put them in front of us, we could have the tail of one audience instead of the tail of two audiences. Right, 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 like, right. I'm doing well on the left. I could kill once instead of bombing twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> That'd at, be least, great. at least if both sides don't like you, you know it's a unanimous decision. <laughs> you know, it's not one of those boxers where you lost on a split decision and one of the judges screwed you. You're like, no, this is a clean sweep. They yeah. are not a fan of yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Um, but the, the so JD's Comedy Cafe used to be <clears throat> in the Midwest. That was like the room. Like if you couldn't kill in this room, you couldn't do comedy. Wow. It, it was, was a like, real meter. It was, it was a test. It was just a kill box. It right. was an awesome room. They did three shows on Saturdays. And they used to have um, an announce. They'd have a four a four person lineup. Okay. They'd have the MC, the feature, the headliner. But before the MC, they had the first MC <laughs> who was like an announcer. And you would do two minutes. And and that was that was the first time I ever got paid to do comedy was you did as the, the announcer. Minutes. I did so you'd basically say, Hey, welcome everyone, fill out your comment cards, you'd tell one joke, and then you would bring up the MC. Wow. And that was it. <clears throat> and all four of these people would stay in the world's most disgusting condo, which was right across the street. And it had like a stack of broken TVs that must have been used for like hiding drugs in or something. Yeah. <laughs> um they used JD used to pay you with a gun on the table. Oh so it was like one of these, it's another one of these things like Mark Ridley, except like more you're fearing for your life rather than your right. career. I don't know why these people think like, oh, they'll kill harder if they're afraid, you know? No. But uh, I've never done well scared. I've <clears throat> done well comfortable. That's when I do well on stage. Right, when I'm right, comfortable, right. not when I'm terrified for my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I, I bet you he didn't pay a lot. No, but it was like, no, I mean, I definitely, like, not the first announcer. Right, but even all the way up, like, I, he couldn't have paid, was he? because he's out of business, and I just, I picture well, comedy so, club under a strip club where the condo's across the street, and there's four, you know? Again, JD's, this is not the strip club one, this is a different one. That's right. The, the strip club the one, I, I was yeah. only there once, I forget what it's called. Right. That's a whole other thing. But JD's, which was a great club, JD was like... I don't know. It was he was in some motorcycle club they call it, but they, it had a sort of mobbed up vibe. Right. And everyone was packing, you know. And eventually, JD had like a stroke or something, and then it, they ended up going out of business. I guess he owed back taxes, and then someone else bought it. And then it was Milwaukee's Comedy Cafe, and it was still a good room. Okay, but it wasn't like that magical, like the best room in the country right. kind of thing. And then. Now I think it, then it moved somewhere else. I don't know if it's still there at all. I think it went out of business because now Milwaukee, I think they just got an improv, but I, I, yeah, they just got an improv, but I work this music venue called Shank Hall, which is like a, it actually looks like a comedy club. Okay. It, it seats about 200. It's great. I've done it a couple of years in a row. I'm going back in a month, but, um, there's also a place I see on like, uh, Instagram or TikTok a lot. That's I forget. Yeah, the comedy tap or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I haven't yeah. been there. So th I think those are the rooms there. Is that one that you're talking There's... about? The improv, and then I'm jamming my show into a music venue that doesn't really do comedy. But that's great. Those are the best venues. No, those are super fun. Yeah. I, I love that venue a lot. It feels more like a comedy club than some of the ones I've been to. But uh, it's it's funny. I was just thinking of this. You know how you were saying that that JD JD's room was like the, if you don't kill here, you don't belong in comedy? Yeah. We had that in where I, I came up in San Diego, and the room we had for that was in Tucson, Arizona. It's Laughs in Tucson. Okay. I don't know if you've ever done it, but no. it was, it's just, you can't bomb there. And mm -hmm. if you bomb, it's wow. wow. It's you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but also very similar, the worst comedy condo there's ever been. There was a, a guy who worked there, his name was Hoodie. He's a former comedian who was like the... Uh, um, time keep you know he worked the sound booth and uh you'd stay with him in this weird house it was dark it was locked from the inside it was very creepy and then he passed away and i worked like the weekend after or two weekends after he passed away and i slept in his dead bed like the bed mm. he died in and then uh, and i'm like is it and then like he was only in there for like a couple hours and i'm like well you know still and so it was one of those rooms, like it was completely papered. No one paid for a ticket. The club owner was old school where he like, he didn't want to pay you a lot, but he made you work up the ladder to get to the, the mm -hmm. billing where you found out, wow, I've been working four years to make this. And uh, yeah, yeah. He, it was yeah. one of those yeah, where yeah. you're like, all right, well, you come in. I don't know if you're ready to co-headline. Are you ready to co-headline? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I ended up making like 800 bucks to headline the comedy cafe or something when I finally yeah, That's about the there. same yeah. for uh, laughs in Tucson once you like made it up to that 
once you had to run through the rigmarole of like co-headlining and mm-hmm. then this and then that, and you're like, I don't know if you're ready. Are you ready? And it, those are the the clubs that make you jump through the most hoops are the ones where the prize at the end was a, a spoiled. It was a spoiled prize, and you're right, like, right, what right. was I working for right, right. for four years to get this horrible paycheck? Right, right. The prize is in like uh, like uh, francs or something, and they're like, oh man, we don't even use those anymore. <laughs> Uh, Roy Wood Jr. had this great joke on one of his specials where um, they uh, he goes, only the worst jobs do they kind of pay you with a camaraderie, kind of like military or police. Like, they don't pay you well, so they pay you with the way of, like, brotherhood. Like, oh, there's sure. a... There's a com- and it was the same with bad comedy clubs that didn't pay well. They would always tell you, you know, Seinfeld worked here. Yeah, I bet once. I bet once in, like, 89. And right, and then never, he never came he back. He never came back. Yeah. Like, and then they would kind of... Or it was different in the 80s, too. I mean, it was just like... They probably, they probably weren't papering more. back then. You know? No. So... It- when they paper, it's like, if you're actually selling tickets, it's a whole different thing. Completely different. Yeah. But yeah, now they're in the free ticket market. But yeah. But that's the whole, I mean, like, I think, you know, I got to figure out this transition. I think you're doing awesome, by the way. Mm. But like, the only way that I know how to move up and do comedy is like, I came from that world where it's like, yeah. okay, I'm featuring. Well, just bury the headliner. Yes. You know? Yeah. And there's no, there's none of that anymore. No. I mean, I guess... There really some isn't. Clubs. Some clubs you can still do that, but, but it's those like clubs one are club dying at a time, and that yeah. you don't build a following that way, and that's just really not—that's not the game. No, and it was kind of a dick move to begin with, but you know, I mean, I, it is the move though. Like I, the first club that moved me up to headliner was the Loonies in Colorado Springs, and it's because I kept doing well and making the headliner's job hard and doing it the right way, not by just doing all like crowd, crowd work, work or, 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 or just being dirty. Like I did all material and kept it fairly clean so it was like the right way to do it and i was like well that's how you get ahead in this but then the clubs that do that and work that way then what did you work up to now you became a uh, a road club headliner which is cool and an accomplishment in our world but like you said you don't build a following that way and now you've peaked now you see what your paycheck is at some of these clubs unless you're selling tickets it it kind of plateaus in that in that in that region there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's not peaking at a um, at a level where you can save for retirement and put your children through college and all I, of that. I don't know how you all live. Of that extra Depending stuff. on where in the country you live, I don't know how you make a living off a thousand bucks a week, thousand to fifteen hundred a week. Right. It's like well, after expenses, they're not paying for your flight, they're not paying for your rental car, they'll give you a place to stay. Uh, but you're like, I would have to be on the road. If you're living in one of the cities where it's expensive, i.e. San Diego, Los Angeles, New York, uh, I don't know if a thousand bucks a week after expenses, you would have to work every week to maybe rent like a room in a, in a with like a bunch of roommates. And that's this. just you. And that's just you. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, it's you have to do it this other way. But thankfully now there's less gatekeepers and you can just – be a yeah. jackass on TikTok and yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. sell some tickets on the road and then kind of bypass all that. Dude, I love that this podcast, we can just come on here and do math. I mean, that's, yeah. that feels good. <laughs> this, Should remember, we talk about inflation now? I bet, <laughs> I bet a thousand bucks a week was a lot in 1987. That's the thing about it is it never went up. <laughs> it never went, it never went <laughs> up. It never went up. And they're like, we'll pay you that. I had a club in, in Tennessee somewhere. They're like, I can give you a thousand bucks to come. This is when I lived in San Diego. Yeah. I guess I'm closer to it now. They're like, I can give you a thousand bucks to come out to Chatt- Chattanooga. And I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Uh-huh. Like, Do you know where I live? Do you know what flights cost? Do you know any of this? Like, I might leave with 200 bucks after that. Well, they do that because somebody else will. I know, yeah. but I, and, I, and no knock on the people taking those gigs because I used to take those gigs. Yeah. I, it's it's Actually, a right of passage. Actually, do you have this passage. guy's number? Because uh, I'll re- I'll connect you. Yeah, it's, please. It's a, it's a lady, but her and her husband run this uh, run this club. I'll go to Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Yeah, I yeah. would like to go to Chattanooga. That, I'll lose money to go to Chattanooga. <laughs> the way I look at, it, I don't know. I, I just like I don't even, I don't even look at road stuff in terms of you, you've like I said you figured it out how to sell tickets, which is great. But I just I do road stuff. Right. The reason I do road stuff is is I'm like I want to put the act together. I want to run the hour. That's and I'm not even trying imp- to make money. No. Then, uh, first of all, you it's hard to put the act together without doing the hour. It's impossible. It's damn near impossible to try to to you try can't to know for sure. You can have an idea. Well, this goes here. This goes here. This goes here. But until you do it, you you need like a proof of concept. Yes. Is this an hour? Yes. Not, and I don't mean time wise. I mean like conceptually. Is it a cohesive thing? Does it make sense? Does it work? Where are the lulls? 
where yeah. where are all the pieces that should fit together like a better puzzle? That's where you go to figure things out. Yeah, totally. And uh, and does this work out of New York? Like, is this something that's so just true. like for hipster assholes at you know in Brooklyn where I do my show every week, or is this like actually like universally funny? You know, I feel like I've watched your act enough. I was actually watching your Don't Tell set, which I highly recommend people check out. Oh, thank you very much. It's yes. Very fun. I don't see that like a set like that. I don't see that failing anywhere, whether it's Tucson, Arizona, or Dallas, Texas, or Brooklyn, obviously, where you where you uh, where you're every week and put well, on killer shows. But well, thanks, buddy. Yeah. So but that's the idea. That's what I want. Like I want yeah. it to work in Brooklyn. But I don't want it to only work in Brooklyn. Of course. And I want it to work on the road, but I don't want it to only work on the road. You know, that's, a, that's it's the sweet the, spot. It's the sweet spot of comedy. I forget, maybe uh, Pete Holmes talked about it on, on one of his podcasts. We called it Getting Some Road On You, where mm. you're on the road a lot, and then you come back to L.A. or New York or wherever your home base is, and you do one of the local shows, and you're like, ooh, I got a little... <laughs> like, yeah, totally. I, I have 100%. a little, <laughs> yeah, a little yeah, comedy yeah. zone on me right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a... I got to shake this off a little bit. That's why it's so good to have the balance. Yeah, Go it's do, like you put on a jacket you haven't worn for a while, and you find a little bit of women be shopping in the pocket. You know? <laughs> like, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> tell you about this airport i'm i'm uh, i'm pretty guilty of the airport jokes but well there's nothing wrong with an airport joke no it's uh it's when i do them where i'm like i have a problem with this airport joke uh the, i mean the, the the barometer is is it funny to you like if you're saying it because you think you're gonna get a laugh that's not that's right that needs to go if you're saying it because it happened at the airport but is it legitimately funny to you right. then that's good i i stole a bottle of water you know that's what I did. Did you? Yeah, at the airport. Yeah, here. You, you could have done that anywhere. Ah, but here at the airport, that's you're really not hurting anybody. That's, right, because you stole an $8 bottle of water. Yeah, right I'm not hurting the family that runs Hudson News. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, if yeah. I steal it from a mom and pop shop, I see who I'm kind of screwing over on this bottle of water. And it's a little more anonymous at the airport. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's finding the healthy balance. You run one of, or you're a part of. Did you start comics you should know yeah well i was like part of a crew of of people who started it in chicago right and then when we when i moved out here uh we started like a sort of satellite uh comedians you should know um with some other chicago expats cool and, uh, i was at david drake and soreen choksi and um jeff steinbrunner okay and we all started it now dave and i run it with some some other people all right yeah. and then you also have a, a, a an la version I believe. Yeah, apparently. I think they're doing a monthly show now at uh, the Comedy Store. Okay. Um, yeah. And that's like uh, Aaron Weaver and Ryan Dalton, and I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then uh, Chicago, one of my, you came up in one of my favorite cities to visit. Like, oh, hell I, yeah. I, I love Chicago. What a great comedy town. What a great nightlife town. Everything seems to be open till 4 a.m., and it feels like they could stretch it to 6 a.m. and people would stay. It's a mm -hmm. real drinking, going out, beautiful, music friendly, art kind of centric city. It's and like also pretty chill. Chill. Yeah, yeah. People are friendly. There's not a. Uh, the edge is, it's a Midwest edge to where you're like, yeah, we got stuff to do, but we're not going to be rude to you. Like, I, I've had, I've met some of the friendliest people out there. Oh, well, right on. Yeah. No, often I wonder why I left. It was pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> How long have you been in New York now? Oh, uh, like seven years or something. But you got to, uh, six years, I think. Um, you got to leave. You know, it's yeah. like you get to a certain point in Chicago and like you even feel people looking at you like, what are you still doing here? <laughs> Dude, yeah. I got that look so much in San Diego. And, but I liked, I didn't want to move. I was, oh, I've been trying to move to New York for like three, four years now. And then finally I'm like, well, we can, we can move there. My wife and I can move there and, and not struggle. We have at least enough money to like live. Thankfully, San Diego just almost just as expensive as as New York. Uh -huh. It's still a little more here, but like it was financially, it was more of a lateral move. And I'm like, okay, like this will be comfortable. I'm extra safe. That's who I am. Yeah, extra safe. Do we have money for this? Do we have money for that? Okay, now we will make this little step. Where like a comic two years in will be like, I'll live uh, under a basement. In, and then I respect the hell out of that. I just don't have that yeah. in me. I don't have that in me. I'm like too far out on the other side where like, I'm like that. I'm like, yeah, I'll live in your closet, but I'm also <laughs> going to bring my wife and kids. Yeah. <laughs> you guys cool with that? Oh, well, too bad. I already booked the ticket. 
Uh, yeah, no, that was, was that was ask. rash. That was rash indeed. <laughs> I was about to ask you, the three kids from Chicago, or uh, did you guys have them here in New York? No, they, I had them all already, and I was like, nah, they'll fit. Oh, yeah. Wow. They'll fit in the, we'll find a space. Hey, we like each other. We don't need a lot of space. And <laughs> we ended up in a, we started in a two-bedroom apartment in Queens, and it, but it was also, it was like completely unaffordable. It was a total nightmare. And then I started working on these like cruise ships to like make Oh, you money. did cruises. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. did for a while before. Before the pandemic did you do that i've done i haven't done one since the pandemic but i uh they they helped float my comedy career from like 2016 no to 2019 no intended yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i didn't mean we hope work. they float it <laughs> um yeah um but then it got to the point there where i was like okay so like i'm um and, and i did also take advantage of the pandemic to like never go back because i hated it so yes. much yeah but like yeah i'm like i'm in new york i'm working on these cruise ships and i'm like oh Am I making my family live in a 600 square foot apartment on top of each other just so that I can like not even be here ever? Right. Yes. Like what? So Yo, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's funny. Yeah. Same for me. 2019, then the pandemic happened and my wife and I focused on how can we sell tickets so I never have to go back on a cruise ship again. Yeah. Because it was, smart. it was. And you got your wife in your corner? Yeah. Well, she helps with like all my advertising and stuff because I don't know any of that stuff. So yeah. she, but she has a background in that. So she's been super duper, uh, integral. No, I was that. listening to the, your last episode with Jake, uh, Silverman yeah. where you yeah. guys were talking about it. And I got real jealous. I was like, man, I wish my wife was like Zoltan's wife. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. But it's, it was like, but taking that time, the point is we both made that decision during that downtime of like, how can I not go back? Totally. Because you just see it. I mean, how many times did you work with like a comedian who was uh, had 20 or 30 years on you and you just saw how... Did you get to work with other comedians on ships or yeah, were you yeah. always by there yourself? There were usually two comedians. We weren't on the same show. We'd have different shows, but we'd go to okay. we'd hang out, watch each other's shows. Yeah, yeah. There, was, there were times... Usually I'd be on... I worked Royal Caribbean where normally I would be by myself, but sometimes I would be on a big ship where they had a comedy club and it would be two comics. And so the times I got to meet some of the other comedians specifically, they just had an... Most of them were really nice and then you'd meet some where you're like, they had an edge of bitterness to them. Mm. Like, I almost did this. And then... And they just had this real anger t towards the world of comedy and just everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I could see me becoming that. I have that little tickle in here to where like, yeah, let's blame everybody for mm -hmm. whatever I created. And um, I and then on top of that, the show sucked. I didn't enjoy them. And I felt uh, creatively Horish. I don't know how to describe that. Well, I it's just, tough. Yeah, it's because, tough because you just, it's like you know you're one. It's like people are like, should we, they're not really choosing to go see comedy. They're like, no. Well, should we see comedy or should we go to the casino? Yeah, you're like one of two options. Yeah, I I now know what the guy who played Aladdin at Disneyland probably felt like when I was there watching the show because I liked the show, but I was like, oh, this guy wants to be working like on Broadway. Of course. It, not yeah, yeah. at the theme park where like there's some sunburned tourists right. in shorts staring at you with their bald knees. Like mm -hmm. nobody wants that. And that's what comedy on a cruise ship is like. And you're stuck out there and you're gone for so long. You're like, what are we making this money for to keep my, your family, you know, trapped in a place. Trapped in Queens. <laughs> yeah, trapped yeah, yeah, in yeah, Queens. yeah. 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 To keep them in like a bad Kurt Russell sequel. <laughs> Yeah. How old are your kids? Well, my oldest just turned 21. And then oh, I wow. An 11 year old and an eight year old. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wow. 21, 11 and eight. Man. So I guess I moved here eight years ago because I moved here right after the baby was born and now she's eight. Wow. That's crazy. How, dude. I know, you, like you, you and your wife, I'm sure, are pros now at just raising kids. My wife and I talk about it. Mm. We're at that. We're like a lot of people around my age group where we're like, yeah, we're thinking about it. And mm -hmm. then the years to keep taking by, and we're like, eventually we gotta like make a move here yeah, if yeah. we're gonna have a eventually kid or we'll not. Be like, well, we were thinking about it, and, and then now we can't. We, and then yeah. it'll be we thought about it. <laughs> yeah, we thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, we don't have money for surrogates. Uh, but it's like, how do you, how do you do it? How do you just have, like, not literally, I know how the kids are made, but then they're there, and you're doing comedy, and, and I'm sure your wife does something, and then... <laughs> she does something. And then you have problems, <laughs> and then they have problems, and you gotta sit down and, and go, like, I don't know. I, I, I was on a flight, and a kid asked his mother how the airplane flies, uh -huh. and she explained it. It was Bernoulli's principle. What? So the uh, wing is curved 
on the top so that the it's got a larger surface area on the top than the bottom. Okay. So if it goes sufficiently fast, the air pressure underneath the wing is higher because it's the same volume of air going a shorter distance. So that lifts the plane that, that up That creates the air. lift. Yeah. See, that's the kind of stuff I think you need to know before you have kids. Because otherwise, hmm. I'm going to... Well, now if, you know. Now you're ready. Well, now I know. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. Bernoulli's yeah. principle. You got it. Yeah, it's Burgundy's. No, no, no. I mean, that's a good question. How do I do it? Zoltan, my life is utter chaos. <laughs> You seem like a planner. I am. Yeah, I, I am. I liked it. I'm a. I'm a. Like, let's break things and then figure it out. So uh, right. here, one of my earliest comedy um, uh, contest experiences was I entered the Iowa Comedy Festival, where the grand prize was a thousand dollars. Great. Okay, it was a two day thing. There was one round the first day, one round the second day. I drove out there. And I made it past the first round, and then I had to make a decision. Um, I had enough money either for a hotel or for gas to get home. Oh my god! <laughs> so I was like, "Let's." I'm putting it all on black. I put it on a hotel, and I was like, "Now I have to win this contest. If I don't win this contest, I can't get home." Wow! So I won. Beautiful. Um, so I just figure like, well, if it worked in Iowa, you know, it'll work in Queens. It'll work in, uh, it'll work on the high seas. It'll work. It'll work. It'll work. It'll work. That is it worked so, once. It has to work every I time. I want a little of that. That little of, I don't have, I'm such a, well, we have to do, like, here's a, uh, we, I did the Seattle comedy competition and it's a month. It's a month. And I, I didn't have the money. And my mom's like, my mom and I shared a credit card at the time. And she goes, I'll finance you. So you pay me back whatever the debt is. And I was staying in bloodstained hotels for the first couple mm, of weeks mm -hmm. by the airport in Seattle. And I uh, got to the last week, made it to the finals. My, my mother was like, how's it going? Does it look like you're going to win? And I go, I got a shot. I'm in the top five. She's like, all right, wh what's the winner get? And I, it was five grand that year. Mm -hmm. And she's like, all right, because you get, get about $2,500 worth racked up here. And I go, that's more than I have. So I like really wanted to win. And thankfully I did. Oh, nice. But it's that same principle where I'm like, I would have never put that debt on my credit card without having my mother there to subsidize it because I'm such a... Uh, can't well, go. but you have the right attitude. That's the attitude that like someone super successful, like a Kevin Hart or The Rock, who's like, I was down to my last 13 cents and then I became The Rock. Remember that dumb story he always tells in his little pants? He goes, ah, I was down to my last nickel and then I became The Rock and now I'm, the, and you're like, yeah, right? Yeah, but, it's but like, also how many like people... his dad was a professional wrestler too. I mean, I think these stories That's are true. sort of bullshit. Like, They're yeah, kind of hard. I wouldn't have been able to get back, but like, some, I would have got back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I could have called my parents and been like, right. hey, will you buy me a bus ticket? That's they true. They would have done that. You That's know, true. somebody would have helped me out with, we're talking about $40 or yeah, however much yeah, it takes to get home. That's true. You, you know, know what it is? Is because I was raised by an immigrant parent who told me there's no safety net. Mm -hmm. I can't catch you. Don't get in trouble. Don't go to prison. Don't do it. I can't get you out. I don't have the money for this. And so I was always like on the strict, straight, and narrow. Like I always have to have cover all my bases because no one's going to help you. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah. If I was stuck in Seattle, I'm like, mom, I'm stuck in Seattle. I'm either going to like just live on the streets or you can get me a frontier flight home for a hundred bucks. I, she would give me, yeah, it would have worked out. Sultan, if you're stuck in Seattle and your mom won't help you out, you give me a call. <laughs> Thank you. I got you. <laughs> just put it on my tab. But this is the mentality I think my wife and I need to lean towards to have kids. Because my wife's that way, too. She's very planned and strategic and smart. And I'm not, I don't have the smart aspect, but I'm the planner type as well. And uh, I feel like we need a little more wild child in us, you know? A little more like, yeah, leave it in. Let's yeah. see what these kids are all about. Yeah, and I can yeah, leave it in. Let's see what it does. Yeah. I don't know. I um, Yeah, I feel like we need to meet somewhere in the middle where our hairy knees are. Because I get <laughs> I could use a little bit more. I could use, you know, my wife and I are both pretty wild. That's beautiful. Yeah. But I think you need one wild one and one like, like I used to have a girlfriend who used to just like, I just like create a mess everywhere I would go. And she would clean. And she would just clean up after me. <laughs> and it was like pretty sweet. And I, I feel like she, it didn't bother her. You know, it was like she liked cleaning and I liked making a mess, you know? Do but you, now I, I have, my wife and I, we both like to make a mess. And it's a problem. And now we have a son 
who is like OCD cleaner, and he resents the hell out of us. I so was about much. to say that. I go, how one of your kids has to be the rebellious one. Yeah. So if they're rebelling against two wild children, they're gonna be OCD, super clean, super neat. Put it both. like this: He got a uh, a fancy uh, vacuum cleaner for his birthday. Like that's what he <laughs> that's what he wanted. He got he got a Dyson. No, it's a it's a pet hair vac. It's a whole thing. I wow, don't know it it's not a Dyson, but it's something like that. I How don't old know. is this child? That's eleven. Like, the eleven year old. Wow, that's like the kid you see in the sitcom in the eighties, where like the parents are cool, and then he shows up in a suit. He's real. Yeah, he's yeah. like Carlton or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. that is wonderful. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, it's nice, but I mean. It's nice that like I could invite people over to my house because I have this child who will make sure that it is clean. Right. But um, I think he's like gonna. I'm gonna have to pay for some therapy. You know what I mean? Like it's not. It's not good for him <laughs> to like have to live in this environment that makes him feel uncomfortable. You know. Well, like, I can't go to bed at night until the dishes are done, kind of thing. You know, they all stay uh, up. Where till... did he pick that up? I mean, I don't know. It's not like genetics. Right. Well, or maybe not... it is some weird recessive yeah, gene some... or something. And they kicked in him like this is too dirty here. He's like the manager of the household. Totally. You know? And yeah. you guys are all employees at Arby's, and the manager's coming in going, dude, you got to clean the grease traps. Like, exactly. And you guys are like, all right, I'm sorry. And yeah, like, oh, yeah. And he's like, never mind, I'll do it. You know? Yeah, that that's exactly what it is. I want that. I want, like, I want nice children that don't yell in public and uh, are very respectful. Because, like, my, my wife seems to think that if we have a child, it's going to be like she was when she was a child because she was a, uh, uh, a pain in the ass, in her words, as a kid. And me, I was, like, the perfect kid. My mom took me everywhere, never, never a peep, and just, uh, you know, straight and narrow. So it's a coin toss as to what we're going to end up yeah. with. It, we could end up with the biggest pain in the ass in the world, or we could end up with somebody who just sits in the corner and... Uh, you know, we think he's fine. We find out later it's anxiety, and that's why he's sitting in the corner. But it could it could go one of two ways, and I guess the fear of the unknown is what keeps us from doing everything. Wow, that was deep, man. Yeah, I didn't think it would get there, but I guess that is what it is with everything. That's one of the reasons I keep saying it on this podcast why I moved to New York because the city scares me, and I'm like, well, I'm 36 now. It's time to face some fears. Time to go where it's scary. Having kids scares me. What if you're a failure and you ruin this person's life? You know, and you just got to go, well, I'm going to take the chance that I won't. Kind of like you took the chance mm -hmm. of I'm going to get out of Iowa. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. For this contest. Well, Zoltan, I mean, are you scared to have children? I'm terrified to do everything. But are you scared to have children? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, then, I mean, I think that's like, that's how you tell whether or not you should do something. You should do something if you really, really want to do it. Right. Or if you really, really don't want to do it. The only things that you shouldn't do are the things that elicit no um, emotional response one way or the other. You know, so like mm. if you feel intense dread about something, like having children, moving yeah, to yeah. New York, whatever, that's a sign that that's something you're supposed to do. Ah. Unless you dread like murdering people. I don't know. No, no, no. I don't dread murdering people. Yeah, you just kind of don't think about yeah, it. Yeah, right? I, don't, I don't think about killing people and I don't kill people. It's kind of even But when even if you did, like don't. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah, when yeah. I'm mad at someone- uh, that I know or don't know. You know how you just get mad at people that you see in public, you see them do something, you're like, what a dick that guy is. Yeah. Even then, I don't think about killing him. I imagine someone really big grabbing him by the ear and just yelling at him good. Oh, do you? Yeah, like someone <laughs> like The Rock come by go, hey, don't do that. <laughs> I, I wasn't down in my last 13 cents so that you could... Oh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While he buttons another cufflink. I, uh, I, don't, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I think you just got to step into the things that scare you. And... That's it. I'm. I'm. I'm gonna. So you're gonna have kids. We. I, we I think we. I think we figured that out. I'm gonna text my wife and go. Hey, we're 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 having kids. Whether you like it or not. Well, then not like that. But like you know, like she, it'll, she'll be like, I think I'm ready too, and then we'll figure it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, don't tell her whether you like it or not. Yeah, that, as soon as I said it, I'm like, I meant it to come out like in a way like I've made a decision for us because none of us will pull, either of us won't pull the trigger. We're both like this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we're both bungee jumping, but mm -hmm. we're doing tandem, even though we don't know what we're doing. And we're both doing this. And then one of us just needs to go, I'm doing it and you're coming and, mm -hmm. and do it like that. But in a romantic way with flower petals and such. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah fl flower petals. Yeah, a lot of those after the kids come out. <laughs> All yeah, three of your yeah. kids were made with flower petals on the on the on the uh, comforter i'm sure yeah 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 all of them were super intentional and uh yeah definitely definitely all planned um but definitely uh you know glad that they're here glad that they're here no matter what uh, regardless of how many flower petals and decisions and uh 
pros and cons lists may or may not have been made. Yeah, yeah. I love it. When uh, when my wife is pregnant one day, I'm going to call you up and go, Mike, it happened, and it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what's going to happen. And then I will know that my work here is done. <laughs> uh, is there, before we leave, is there anything you'd like to plug before we leave? A podcast, a show, uh, a set on YouTube, or a set anywhere, anything you'd like to plug? Oh, yeah. Um what do I have coming up? Oh shit! I should have thought of this before I came. It's okay. This, uh, I should have told you before. But well, I mean, I, I should have. I know what a podcast is. I know. Um, yeah, I just uh, comedians you should know if you're in New York. Come to comedians you should know every Wednesday and Saturday. Excellent show. And uh, yeah, check out my um, my uh, my don't tell special on YouTube. Just type in my name, Mike Leibovitz. Check it out, and then uh, you know follow me on all the. Instagram, TikTok. It's uh, all your name, right? It's all just at Mike Leibovitz, M-I-K-E-L-E-B-O-V-I-T-Z. There it is. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, cheers, everybody. I'm going to go be a dad. Trekking heavier, traveling light. There's one thing that's right wherever I go. That's where I am.